Thank you, Ethan and Maya and Sean and all your team for setting this up. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. And thank you, Mr. Bridges, for being here. And thank you for your service. We proudly have a grandson currently at the Air Force Academy. So um, I just wanted to make sure that we thank you for that. I'm a native Idahoan. I grew up on a small farm on, on, near the, on the Snake River near Marsing with four brothers. And my teacher, my parents were both teachers because they needed that income to keep the farm going. I graduated from Valley View High School, went to Whittier College, received my bachelor's of science degree from Idaho State University and my master's from Boise State University. Um, I'm a retired teacher. I taught, taught for 33 years and I'm currently your District 18 Senator. I've been in the Senate for nine years and my role as a policymaker is to put a system in place that maximizes Idaho's investment, enables businesses to succeed, maintains what we all know and love about Idaho, that's clean air, clean water, open spaces, um, and hunting and fishing and making sure our public lands stay public, but also ensure that our children and grandchildren uh, can stay and thrive in Idaho. You know, we have, we're one of the fastest growing states right now. So with that comes a lot of challenges, opportunities, yes, but challenges. Industry needs a highly skilled workforce institutions like BSU needs funding to re-gear and build their capacity and parents and students want affordability, accessibility, and academic quality. So all of this is possible. It's all possible, but we have to have a plan in place and there is um, funding that has to go with all of these opportunities that we have available to us and all of the um, infrastructure needs and the education that we want for our children. So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Bridges. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, once again, my name is Dan Bridges. I'm a Republican candidate, State Senator, District 18. Uh, well, I want to start by thanking uh, Isaac Seldon, uh, Sean, and uh, all the other students here um, as part of the Associated Students of BSU for hosting this and organizing it. It takes a lot of work. Really do appreciate that. I'd like to recognize the 33 years of uh, educational service from my opponent. That's uh, always appreciated, something that's incredibly valuable. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the faculty and staff here at BSU for hosting this event and supporting it. Um, it's really appreciated. I just want to say that I'm really proud to live so close to Boise State and to Bronco Nation. Um, as I've spent time on campus here at sporting events, Morrison Center, the Alumni and Friends uh, Center, gotten to know coaches, professors, and students associated with this great university. Uh, my pride and awe in what happens here has only grown. Um, there's a real passion for excellence, and you can tell that it's contagious. Uh, here at BSU, uh, the turf is blue and the sky is the limit. And number 15 in the polls is just the start. Um, with that, uh, the question this evening is, what, uh, why am I here and what can I offer you? And that's what this election is all about. So in the next hour or so, I'm hoping to offer a vision of what Boise and Idaho can be uh, so that you as students can graduate and build a home in the future uh, right here in, um, in the local area. It starts by recognizing that Idaho and Boise in particular has gone from being one of the most affordable places in America to one of the least affordable. After graduation, many of you will want to settle here, and we need you to be able to do that. And uh, we know that's going to be difficult, but there is great opportunity. I believe that there are numerous factors that have come into alignment, and if we recognize these opportunities and take advantage of them, uh, this area could be an absolutely fantastic place for you and for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you both. Now we're going to start and just right, move right into it with the questions. So for our first question, we will talk about um, for our first topic for tonight is education. Um, please remember that you guys both have three minutes to respond. Okay, question one. Both of you in this campaign have recognized the importance of K-12 through education and retaining high quality teachers for our state's future. What are your views on the importance of higher education to that future? Senator Janie Ward-Inkling, you have three minutes. 
Thank you. And I, you know, I believe every child deserves a chance to succeed. And I've spent my lifetime making that a reality. Um, vouchers and savings account schemes are on the horizon right now. And that's very problematic for public education in Idaho. We, um, you know, we are second to the last in our funding per pupil in Idaho. We haven't yet re uh, lived up to our constitutional mandate to adequately fund a uniform, thorough, free public education. So we've got work to do there yet. When Alabama and Mississippi and West Virginia are above us in funding, that's problematic. So. Um, my opponent is going to tell you that we need to open up the coffers, the state coffers for private and religious schools. And my opinion is, no, we cannot afford that at this point. Um, it's um, And it's not about parental choice. They're saying, you'll hear it as a buzzword, they'll say, it's all about parental choice. And, and we need to uh, adopt that. We're third in the nation of parental choice. We have charter schools, magnet schools, open enrollment, uh, dual credits, career technical schools, online schools, home schools. We have tremendous opportunities for parents to choose. This is about privatizing education in Idaho. And until we can adequately fund our K-12 schools so they don't have to run levies and bonds. We have $242 million in levies and bonds on the ballot in November. Until we can fund that at the state level, take that off your property taxes, do our job at the state level, we can't afford to fund private and religious schools. As far as higher education, my opponents signed on to the GOP platform, which says, absolutely no funding past K-12. That means no funding for our state universities and our community colleges. That should matter to you as students here. It will triple or quadruple your tuition if that were to happen. And um, we do a really good job of educating people and every dollar we put into the university system, every dollar we fund from the state, maximizes a $250 return for the state. It's important that we keep funding our universities, K-12 program, and make sure that our children and grandchildren have the quality education they need. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Bridges, same question. What are your views on the importance of higher education to the future of Idaho? Well, education absolutely is the key to success. And so I'll, I'll respond to a couple things. Um, I absolutely, absolutely am an advocate of uh, additional educational options here in Idaho. Uh, I was at a conference uh, just a couple weeks ago. My opponent was not there. Uh, the single most important reason that parents and families want education choice or options is to stop bullying. I was uh, informed just here in the last few days a student in Rexburg uh, committed suicide because he was being bullied in school. The second reason is because families want their students to feel safe and only after that do they focus on outcomes. And we obviously and absolutely want excellent outcomes and the system as we currently have it in place has been in place for 134 years. We have great teachers, we have great facilities, but there are children with special needs, families with special needs. We have foster children. We have every student and every child is different and they absolutely deserve the right to, to maximize their opportunity in life. And the system as it currently exists is not doing that. So we need to make some changes in K through 12 and also absolutely support higher education. You know, all of you students here at BSU, you're here for a reason. You recognize the value of higher education in universities. I've got a niece and a nephew at the University of Idaho. Um, my wife is a um, graduate of the College of Idaho. She participated in the Miami program, graduated from medical school at the University of Washington. Uh, I went to the Air Force Academy. We are a family who is dedicated to education, understand the value of education, and I want to make sure that education at every level for every child is supported in every possible way here in Grace and Idaho. If I could respond to a couple of 
things that were mentioned. Of course. One of the things I'm really proud of, and my <laughs> colleagues here tonight also, Representative Elena Rebell, but we were able to get an anti-bullying bill through. And that took a lot of work, but we were able to get that. And there are things now in place to deal with it, to deal with the situation when a child is bullied. And we didn't always have that. There are, there's now a, a lot of training available to uh, educators in that regard. And we also funded this past year safe schools. We put money into what's needed for our schools to ensure that they're safe. And we have an audit going on currently that's auditing every school in the state to see what is necessary, what can we do to make our schools safer. So I'm really proud of those things, I'm proud of the work that we were able to do in that. And um, he's, uh, my opponent's right, we do need to make some changes. We have an antiquated funding formula. It's been in place since the early 1990s and it no longer addresses the way our children learn. It's not flexible enough. <coughs> Having a child be in a classroom for a half day before school gets any funding isn't the way we do it anymore. They can go get a dual credit, they can uh, take career technical classes, and they can do some online classes and still do some in-person learning. But the money isn't, we're not flexible enough to send the money out that way. So we do need to do some work revamp our funding formula and make sure that it's appropriate for the way our children learn today. Thank you, Senator. Uh, follow up, Mr. Bridges. Uh, Senator Warren says that you've signed on to a platform of no funding for higher education. And yet, you've just spoken about the importance of higher education to students and their futures. Can you clarify where your position is on funding for higher ed in New Idaho? Uh, well, absolutely. So. I don't really think it's appropriate for my opponent to put words into my mouth. I, I prefer to do that myself. And um, I absolutely support higher education. Uh, it has uh, brought me success in my life. It's brought success to my wife, my family. Uh, we can look around, higher education is absolutely essential. And this is a fantastic university. You know, with every year, BSU gets better and better. And as a state senator, I would absolutely 100% support funding for this university and for every university in the state of Idaho. Thank you. So we'd like to move on to another issue that many of our students at Boise State cite as one of their biggest concerns during their education, and that is mental health. And my question for both of you is that data from the Centers for Disease Control indicate that Idaho ranks as the sixth worst, worst state in the nation in suicides per capita, with suicide coming in right behind diabetes and strokes as the ninth leading cause of death for adults. The question has two parts. First, why do you think this problem is so bad in Idaho? And second, what would you do if elected to address mental health issues in Idaho? Mr. Bridges, questions to you first. Uh, thank you very much. That's uh, actually a, a really good question. Um, it's hard to say exactly why suicide rates here in Idaho are worse than other parts of the country, although there is a known correlation. Uh, rural areas in the country do tend to have uh, much higher um, drug addiction rates, uh, as well as other mental health issues. So being a rural state is probably a factor in that, but uh, that's just a guess. And, you know, as a state senator, um, as I mentioned, my wife is a medical doctor, so I've got um, great access to some expertise in my very own home. But I would be looking for expertise on this and really on any issue. Uh, looking within District 18, who are experts on this subject? What do they recommend? What kind of actions can we take that have a meaningful result? And then take that to the legislature and see what we can do in order to, to improve those outcomes here in Idaho. Thank you. Senator, same question. Uh, why do you think mental health is such a problem in Idaho, and what would you do if elected again to address it? Thank you, and thank you, and it really is frightening when you look at the statistics in Idaho. When I first started in the legislature, we didn't even have a suicide prevention hotline. We were able to get that implemented. I sat on an interim committee with all the stakeholders. We were able to get that passed, and we were able to get some best practices put in place that had never even been discussed in Idaho. Currently, 
We have established a behavioral health council. It took an OPE study, and that's an Office of Performance Evaluation, to get that up and running. But I'm excited that we're finally seeing some movement in that area. We have all three branches of governor, government involved, the legislature, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. So we've got a team now working together on what can we do in Idaho. One of the things we need to do is we need more mental health uh, providers and we need more counselors. We have the lowest ratio of counselors in the nation per student, and that has got to change. So that's one thing we did. I will tell you that this past year, we increased the money for counselors in the school districts, but it's not enough. And it's gonna take a tremendous investment from the legislature, and we get pushed back every day on this issue, but we have got to do more to ensure that our children have the uh, things in place to shore them up because there's a lot of depression. We don't all only have the highest suicide rate, we have the highest depression rate and that's problematic. So there are things to do. It's gonna take an investment. We know some of the things that are working in other states and we need to make that happen here in Idaho. Thank you. We're going to move on. Can I just uh, make one comment? Absolutely. So I'm going to just make an observation here and I invite all of you to do this as well. I've heard my opponent here now talk multiple times about monies being allocated for certain issues, certain challenges here in Idaho. And, and that's vitally important. But the real question, and I'm a process kind of person, so what I'm not hearing is, after we allocated these funds, what were the metrics involved to make sure those monies are being properly invested? And what kind of results are we getting for the monies invested uh, here in Idaho? As a state senator, I will ask those questions. When the budget is established, I want to be a goals-oriented budget. There are other senators that are already working on that. But monies are spent on anything, including mental health. We don't want to just allocate funds. We want to set a goal and then set metrics to see if we're meeting our goals. And if not, we need to revisit and figure out why our programs are working and improving on that. If, if I may respond to that. I sit on the Joint Finance and Appropriation Committee and we set every budget in the state. We analyze them, we spend three hours every morning going through budgets with a fine tooth comb. And we do have process-based budgeting. We do look at the outcomes and we look at what's working, what isn't working, where we need more funding, and that's the process. Now, um, as I'm in the minority, I don't always win every argument I have, but I work closely with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. We move forward together on things that we think will move the needle, and that's what we do every single day in the legislature with our budgets. We analyze them, we look at them, we don't, we start from basically from scratch every year. Thank you. We're gonna move on to a topic that's on everybody's minds in Idaho this year, which is Idaho elections. Now, as you both know, Idahoans will be voting this November on Proposition 1, an election reform measure that will shift to an open primary system and ranked choice voting. And our question is quite simple. How do you plan to vote on Proposition 1? Senator Eagle came first, or Senator Roy came, you are first. Thank you, and I do plan to vote yes on Prop 1, and I, thought about it for a while, I really did, because with the ranked choice voting, there will be some places in Idaho where Democrats won't make the ballot. They won't be the top four choices. It'll be two or three Republicans and an independent or constitutional candidate. But I decided we need to go back to an open primary. We had it for 40 years. It worked for us. And that's important because what I'm seeing is a movement for toward extremism in Idaho. We're moving away from those generational values that I grew up with and that I hold dear and the things that Idaho has always been known for, the way we treat our neighbor, the way we 
uh, look out for our children, um, making sure our open spaces stay open and that they're not our, our public lands aren't sold to the highest bidder. These are things I care deeply about. And I think opening the primary so that every single person has a chance to vote. We have judicial people. They can't register for one party or the other. We have state employees that need to stay neutral. It's their job. They can't be partisan. We have federal employees that can be partisan. We've locked those people out of being able to vote in the primary. And so often the re result of that primary is what happens then in the general election and these people never even got a chance to weigh in. So it matters. And I will tell you as an educator, I didn't like registering one party or the other because my students can see that. And not that I was ashamed of being a Democrat, I wasn't. but. We try to stay neutral in the classroom and, and we like our students to think for themselves. And I did not like having them know one way or the other. So it's important we open the primary. The legislature always has the ability to tweak something if they want to, but it's very important. We open those primaries so that every single person has access to voting. Thank you. Same question, Mr. Bridges. Um, I will be voting no. And uh, what you may have noticed, once again, there are two things associated with Proposition 1, open primaries and ranked choice voting. Um, the primary group behind this is Idaho is for open primaries. Uh, I don't know if anyone approaches you, but as folks were going around getting signatures to get the initiative on the ballot, they focused on open primaries, just like my opponent just did said almost nothing about ranked choice vote. If you look at the signs in your neighborhoods, vote yes, prop one, vote in primaries. I would love to have a great conversation about open primaries. And quite uh, frankly, I'm probably on the fence about it. But there are two things in this initiative, and of the two, ranked choice voting is by far the most consequential in impacting our elections. Uh, ranked choice voting would be expensive to implement, it's difficult for voters to understand. It's been proven to reduce voter turnout. And it's also uh, complicated in determining a winner and can also take additional time. Uh, and so when you look at both of these things, um, if the folks wanted an initiative and truly wanted open primaries, why don't we have an initiative just for open primaries? Single subject, single debate, make a good choice and move on. This initiative has forced us to make a choice on not only open primaries, but ranked choice voting. Um, I wrote one article in which the next election cycle, there will be 18 positions on the ballot. There's potential that each of those 18 could have four candidates. That's 72 folks, 72 that you need to understand, and this will be very difficult, if not impossible, to get good information on each one of those candidates in there. So we run the risk of not having the best candidate for each elected office. So I will be voting no on Proposition 1, and I will look forward to some future time when there's initiative with only open primaries. If I can just follow up a little bit on that. Anytime you do legislation, it's a compromise. And we have Republicans and Democrats working on Proposition 1, and this was their best solution to the problem we're seeing in Idaho. Rancho's voting has been done in Alaska and Maine. It's very easy to do. It's done by the computer. And simply you take, if, if somebody doesn't make the 50% threshold, then you go to um, seeing the lowest person, you look at their second choice, they get kicked off the ballot, you look at their second choice. It's been done very effectively in other states. Um, we have heard that it's not going to cost that much money. We already have programs in place that can run the ranked choice voting. So I think it's doable. And um, like I said, um, we need to open our primaries so that everybody has a chance to vote for the best candidate. 
And I went, one last thing? Of course. So ranked choice voting, the idea has been around for about a century. In, in almost every jurisdiction where it's been tried, it's eventually been rejected because of the complications involved that come back to the traditional process. Now, I do have follow-up questions for both of you on this subject. Um, and I'd like to start with, with you, Senator. Um, some opponents of Proposition 1, including former GOP Chair Tom Luna, say that Democrats are supporting structural change rather than going through the hard work of recruiting high-quality, competitive candidates for our elections. Is he right that Democrats are trying to change the rules because they can't win? Thank you. I don't think, I think if you look at it very carefully, you'll see a lot of our mainstream Republicans signed on to Prop 1, and in fact, they're promoting it. Um, you can look at uh, former Governor Butch Otter. You can look at Jim Jones. I mean, there's a long list. Jerry Evans, former state superintendent of the schools. Uh, there's a very long list of Republicans that are supporting this, and because they know it's good for Idaho. As far as recruiting um, good candidates, I think uh, the Democrats have done an excellent job. We have almost um, all of the ballots have a Democratic candidate on there, and I can tell you they are high quality, highly skilled candidates. It's an uphill lift in Idaho right now, it hasn't always been. There was a time in the 1990s where we had a 50-50 split in the legislature. We had 50% Democrats and 50% Republicans. It ha it's one of those sickle, sickle call things, and I think you're going to see an increase in the number of Democrats uh, getting involved. And I, we are seeing it right now. So I don't think it's the lack of high quality. It may be the lack of apathy. There is quite a bit of apathy among voters, and especially young voters. And I'm hoping that's changing. So um, with that, I would say that uh, there were a lot of moderate mainstream Republicans that signed on to this proposition, and it was a compromise. Thank you. And Mr. Bridges, a follow-up for you, specific to you. Uh, House Speaker Mike Boyle, who is a Republican, has hinted that the Idaho legislature may try to repeal Proposition 1 if it does pass in November. If you're elected, would you support efforts to repeal Proposition 1? Uh, thank you for asking that question. I appreciate it. Uh, and um, if elected, uh, I would not. If it's on the ballot and um, the people pass it, then I think the people should have the final say and it should remain law until such time as perhaps another initiative or people have, have an opportunity to have another say. Thank you. We're gonna do one more question and then take our short break so we can get audience questions collected. Um, we're gonna to move to our uh, fourth topic, which is population growth and the economy in Idaho. And our first question is this. Idaho has experienced a notable influx of individuals moving here from out of state. We almost picked up a congressional seat last census. What strategies do you propose to make sure that our infrastructure, housing, and our schools are able to keep up with this population growth? The question is to you, Mr. Bridges, first. Uh, that's an excellent question, and I appreciate it. Uh, so, obviously, uh, this uh, Emerald City in the High Desert has been discovered, and uh, it's no longer what it was uh, just a few years back. And so, there's a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunity. Um, I'll, I'll answer your question. I'm kind of going a little bit beyond it as well. Um, Obviously, as students here at BSU, many of you would like to live here. You recognize the quality of life, many of you from here. And so, what I recognize is that the Treasure Valley is just about to break a million people in population. Um, and uh, we have significant infrastructure, although the state and local entities, counties, and cities are going to have to pay attention in terms of roads, police, education. It's going to be, it's going to be a challenge, without a doubt. Um, I grew up in Atlanta. Atlanta, is, in terms of population, is probably about 40 years ahead of Boise. So I've seen a lot of this growing up. And there's, there's challenges, but there's certainly ways that other cities have done it. We can do it as well. But in terms of economic opportunity, uh, what we're seeing here, what I just want to kind of mention is, you know, we've come out of the pandemic. The Federal Reserve just recently lowered interest rates. Uh, and, and that's typically a, a tipping point in which 
federal policy starts to want to kind of rev up the economy. Uh, here in Idaho, we're number one uh, in regulatory pro-business environment. Our taxes are reasonable. We have an extraordinary opportunity to bring businesses here, manufacturing, uh, service, research, repair, sales. The, the reality is that having grown up not here in Boise, there are thousands of businesses east of the Mississippi that, that know Idaho for potatoes and blue turf. They don't recognize the thousands of fantastic graduates, the BSU graduates every year, and the incredible opportunity that sits right here. Get on a field, it's 10 minutes away, you get on a plane, you can be at two hours in front of millions of American consumers that want to buy American-made products, uh, manufactured and serviced right here. We've got an incredible opportunity, and, and I want to be the state center to go out and, and reach those companies, identify those companies, bring business here and grow wages and grow good jobs and uh, create a future for Idaho. Thank you. Senator, same question. Uh, what strategies do you propose to make sure that our infrastructure, housing, and schools are able to keep up with our population growth? Thank you. We do have unprecedented growth, and, and we're looking at Micron right now, which is in District 18, and, and we know that they're going to bring in 7,000 plus employees. But here's the thing. It's not just the employees that are coming. It's their families that are coming. So we have to invest in our infrastructure. We need to have mass transit in this valley. If you've been on the freeway at uh, traffic time, you know that what should be a 35 com minute commute from Caldwell is now a two and a half hour commute from Caldwell. We now in Idaho, we have people that can work from home and they are, they're working in, in Portland, they're working in Seattle. We've been discovered because of the wonderful access we have to recreation here and to the climate and so much more. But we have not done what's necessary on the infrastructure. We've made a start and we have used our ARPA money and the federal dollars that we received during the pandemic, we've used them wisely. We are raising the dam, Anderson Dam, which will help with our water supply. We have invested over $500 million in roads and bridges, but we can't build enough roads to keep up with the population growth. We have got to do mass transit. There's a plan in place to bring some rail from Utah to Boise, and we're hoping from Boise to Portland, which would, we have the rails, but it's going to be, it's not going to be immediate. It's going to have to take some time. As far as schools, we passed the facilities bill. It's a drop in the bucket, but we know that we have to begin to fund our schools, the facilities at the state level. We did pass a bill that uh, leveraged a billion dollars so there, um, so that there will be schools that can access some of that money. I think West Ada will get about $150 million that will go for facilities. Boise got capped at 40 million probably unfair, but Boise takes the hit a lot of times when it comes to legislation. But um, we can do better, and we have money available at the state level. We can leverage bonds. We can The state can actually take some funds and leverage that and, and allow the, state, the school districts to use that, the state's bonding authority, to fund schools. And that gets it off our property tax. So that's, I'm really excited about that. We've started down that road. There's more to do. Housing, this is the big one. We need affordable housing in this area and for um, our children and grandchildren, frankly. We're, what ha is happening, because we've been discovered, people from outside the state come in, they've sold a house for a lot of money outside the state, they come in, they offer more than the appraisal price, and that prices our children and grandchildren out of being able to buy that house. So, we have to look at some programs, some private, public partnerships to get more housing, and we have to look at creative ways of financing so that our children and grandchildren can live where they work, because that's important. Thank you, Senator.
with that, we're going to take our short break. Alrighty, we'll get started again. Alright, so we'll go with back to the economy. So for our question is, as voters, we often hear two different stories on the economy. Some say that the indicators are looking good and that there's little to worry about. But others say that Americans are hurting and need relief. How do you view the state of our economy and what plans do you have to grow the economy for Idahoans? Senator, you can start. Thank you. And uh, we've had a great economy in Idaho. We came out of the recession faster than any of our surrounding states. And we came out of the per pandemic looking really good. Uh, in fact, we have filled all of our rainy day buckets in the, in the legislature and the government um, to their capacity. And then after we did that, we raised the capacity and filled them again. So we've got um, quite a bit of money. In fact, uh, it's close to $800 million sitting there that we can use if we were to see a recession come to Idaho. But more important than that, since 2019, think about that, since 2019, so five years, we have given four billion dollars in tax rebates or tax cuts here in Idaho. And while it's certainly appropriate to give money back when we have a surplus, the thing that keeps me up sometimes at night is did we do too much too quick? And do we have the money that we need to provide all the infrastructure as we're uh, growing at such a fast capacity here, such a fast pace? So I do worry about that a little, but our economy in Idaho has been strong. Doesn't mean that we don't have some things to watch. We have, um, in fact, we're seeing our, our surplus is about 56 million. We don't have the we don't have the hundreds of millions we've seen the past couple of years. So we know we're gonna to have to be careful, but we are very fiscally responsible in Idaho. We balance our budget every year, and we've done a good job at that, and it's paying off. Alrighty, thank you. Dr. Bridges, the same question goes to you. How do you plan, what plans do you have to go to the economy for Idahoans, and what is the view of the state of our economy? Well, uh, great question, and it, it can be kind of confusing sometimes, uh, but uh, bottom line is, I uh, you know uh, when I go to the grocery store, when I buy gas, uh, when I do all the normal things in life, um, it's gotten a lot harder today than it was a few years ago. And so uh, the economy is definitely more challenging. And, and as I've been preparing for, uh, to run for office and, and also for this debate, I've looked at a lot of the basic economics of Idaho. And, uh, my opponent is totally right. We, uh, in terms of Idaho versus other states in the country, we have a strong economy. Uh, we uh, have uh, good governance, and because of that, um, a lot of good things have happened. But wages in particular have not even begun to keep pace with the cost of housing, mortgages, rent, uh, gas, and everything else. And so the challenge for us here is how do we raise wages in a way that makes Idaho more affordable for graduates of BSU for everyday families. And the economics is pretty simple for us and econ makers. You create an environment where the demand for labor is greater than the supply. And that's the only way that you can, without unnecessary regulation or things that don't work, raise wages. And so when I talk about going out and bringing businesses to Idaho, talking to local businesses, asking them how they can grow, expand their markets. We, if we create a vibrant economy here, wages will go up and wages will begin to match the cost of living here. And we can all move forward in a really productive and prosperous way. Maybe just to add to that, if Absolutely. I could. Thank you. Um, I, I believe that education is the key. Um, our businesses need a highly skilled workforce. They're begging for it. And we're working hard on that. One of the things that we did this year is we passed the launch program, which provides scholarships basically for high school graduates if they enter an in-demand career. And those are high paying jobs 
They're necessary to keep the economy growing in Idaho. And we have nine, over 9,000 students um, get those um, launch grants this year to um, basically to advance their training, either cert certification or college. And so I'm excited to see how that works in the future. Can I respond? Of course. I 100% uh, agree. I um, applaud my opponent on voting for um, Idaho Launch. I think it's a fantastic program. Uh, the kind of jobs that are being funded are um, providing grants for folks who are going to be nurses, plumbers, electricians, welders, the kind of jobs that we need and will help us grow the economy. So with that, why don't we consider a launch prep. If it works for students above the grade of 12, why not offer something below grade 12? If it works for older students, it could just work for younger students as well. All right, thank you so much. So now we'll move on to the next topic, which is immigration. So our first question, it's gonna be, according to a report by McClure Center for Public Policy Research, about 35,000 people living in Idaho are currently here illegally. How do you believe we should approach the issue of illegal immigration? Um, Senator Jane, do you want? Sorry, get my mic on here. Well, uh, Immigration is a federal policy. It's not really, it does impact Idaho, but it's not really a policy that we have a lot of control over. I will tell you that I supported uh, Senate Joint Memorial 102, and we requested that the Vice President of the United States and the House of Representatives um, stop illegal immigration, secure our borders, adopt and implement targeted immigration reforms. And to be fair, I think they had a bill in place, a bipartisan bill in place, one that was written by Republicans. And at the last minute, it was derailed by um, Mr. Trump, who decided that that wasn't going to work for his campaign if, if that was taken care of. But we do need, um, we need an effective guest worker program where we expand the amount of time they can be here as a guest worker. And that would be one thing that we can do. And we could do that actually here. We could help do that. We may need a little help from the federal government, but we could expand a guest worker program. We could always also do um, make sure that people are here lawfully, but as we have what we call dreamers and they are people that have they are children and students and and citizens well not citizens yet but uh, they have lived their whole life in the united states if they're lawful people and they lived here their whole life we need to provide a pathway to citizenship not amnesty but some kind of pathway right now we have over two million jobs in the nation that even if every single person was working, we don't have the capacity to fill those jobs. So we need lawful immigrant, lawful immigration that's controlled, that's lawful, and that has to be done in the federal level. But we can do a few tweaks. All right, Dr. Richards. Oh, thank you very much. Um, it is a great question. We all know Trump's at the southern border. Um, and again, I would agree with my opponent. It's uh, the big picture is a federal issue. Uh, there's limited things that uh, we could do here locally. But one thing she didn't mention that uh, I'm sure it's on her mind, but I will absolutely mention and I would support. Um, we want to make sure that we support our law enforcement and all the folks, uh, as we've just seen down in Aurora. Uh, with the Venezuelan gangs. We don't need that sort of thing here in Idaho, certainly not in Boise. So I want to make sure that we absolutely support um, our police officers and all the folks out there who are ensuring the public safety and uh, do whatever we can to make sure that our neighborhoods uh, stay safe. And if I may just follow up on that, you're exactly right, uh, Mr. Bridges, on that. And one of the problems we have is we don't have enough 
uh, law enforcement people going through post. We expanded the capacity this year. That's the training that they need to be a police officer. But here's the problem. Our state, our Idaho State Patrol officers, they're being hired away from Idaho as soon as they're trained because they can make more money in another state or more money for the sit from the city or more money from the county. So it does become a little bit of a financial issue for the state. We've got to come up with the money to ensure that we keep our state patrol officers in place. Alrighty, thank you. I do have a follow-up for Mr. Bridges. The Idaho GOP platform says that these illegal aliens should be deported, referring to any migrant who crosses the border illegally. As a member of the GOP, do you agree with this position? Well, that's a good question, actually. Um, and uh, I absolutely, you know, I'll, I'll say two things about it. One, we clearly uh, need immigration reform at the national level. We do need immigration. We need strong immigration. We need legal immigration. And in terms of illegal immigration, uh, you know, fundamentally, I think that I would uh, support uh, deporting folks who have come here illegally. And I would focus on those who have committed crimes or um, other things of that nature. We, we don't need those people here they need to be sent back to where they came from and if they you know come through legal means uh to come and join the united states all righty then we will go ahead and move on to our next topic which is polarization for our first question here it's a new poll um commissioned by the leadership conference on civil and human rights finds that 73% of Americans are worried about political violence after the elections in November. What is your message to voters on both sides of the aisle and who have, who have these concerns? Senator? We need to move um, toward uh, collaboration and working together in this nation. Um, we've become too polarized, and it's not good for anybody um, to see what we saw um, January 6th after the last election. That's not, um, that's not good for democracy. And so I would hope that everyone can accept the outcome of the election. We have free and fair elections in this country if there's a problem or somebody perceives a problem, it goes to court. That's the way we do it in a democracy. It goes to court, we let the uh, judicial branch decide if there's a problem, and we have to agree to accept the results. That's what a democracy is. We vote and we turn over sometimes the whole administration but that's the way it works. And we aren't always thrilled with what happens, but we have to agree to accept um, the votes um, because that's what a democracy is. So I do believe that the media has a responsibility and the political leaders have a responsibility to come together on this issue and ask the citizens of the United States to accept the results and work together to make us, uh, to continue to make us the greatest nation in the entire world. Thank you. Mr. Bridges, would you like to talk about also what is the message to the voters on both sides of the aisle? We're concerned about this. Well, my message is um, pretty simple. Uh, we live in the greatest nation in the history of the world. We have more opportunity, more freedom uh, than really anybody in the history of the world. We need to appreciate what we have. We have an electoral process. We have a rule of law. Let it go through the process. Let the results play out. Respect the process and move on and appreciate what we have. Grow what we have. Um, I was just, I'll, I'll let you be honest. So last week I was, um, I took a cruise in the Eastern Adriatic. So it was from Greece, but at Montenegro, Croatia, and Venice and Italy. And I can't tell you how many people, one, said we love America, uh, particularly in Montenegro. Now, uh, Madeleine Albright, he said, I love Madeleine Albright. He, he gave us, she gave us opportunity here with a simple phone call. And every single one is looking at our election. They're looking to us to, for leadership. They recognize 
that America is the greatest nation in the world. And if we're going to move to a better place, America is the only country in the world that can lead us there. And so we need to remember that as citizens, it's not just about us, it's about the entire world. And so if we can remember that, we will move to a better place. Thank you. Uh, our next question in this topic is um, a, a kind of a personal one for a lot of students looking at leadership today. We know that politics can sometimes get a little feisty. And in the spirit of civil discourse, we were wondering if each of you could tell us something about your opponent that you respect. And I would start with, it uh, looks like Mr. Bridget, you're first. Well, it's an easy one. 33 years as a teacher. I can't um, tell you how many folks that I've talked to uh, in District 18 who either have her as a teacher or one of their um, I kids had her as a teacher. And uh, she was clearly a um, really well liked teacher. She was a very effective at her job and, and well respected. And at 33 years, I think we, I don't think we can applaud her. Anymore. And I just have to thank Mr. Bridges for his service. I he graduated from the Air Force Academy, and I know how hard that is to get in. And I know it's a it's a great school, and he obviously excelled there. And so I would thank him for that. And I really thank anybody who puts their name out there to run for an office. It's not easy to do, and sometimes um, it's it's a little frightening. So I appreciate the fact that uh, he's running for office, and that's that's important. We need people to be engaged in our government. Thank you. And now we have one final question from our moderated portion before we move on to the student Q and A. It's a pretty broad one, so feel free to approach it however you'd like. The question is, how will you model responsible civic leadership if you are elected, Senator? I think I've been doing that most of my career. Um, in a classroom, you work with a diverse group of students and parents, and, and you try to find the places where you can agree. And that's that's how you work forward, and and that's how you um, move the needle on on not only learning but on issues. And I have um, this year I sponsored or co-sponsored twenty bills, most of which became law. And I can't do that in the minority uh, unless I've built relationships. Uh, with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. And sometimes I farm my bills out to them because they can get it passed a little easier than I can, but we work together. We go meet with all the stakeholders. We um, bring our, our other colleagues along, but I think it's very important to be civil. I try to, even when you get beat down one day or you, or you, um, you know, take a few shots, you go, oh my gosh, but I always remember tomorrow's a new day. I have to work with all these people and I want to make sure that I keep those relationships open. So I think relationship building is a key part of it. And Mr. Bridges, same question. How will you model responsible civic leadership if you are elected? Well, great question. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there's a number of different ways to do that. Uh, one is uh, focus on honesty. Uh, I think honesty and integrity we could probably all agree that there's not enough of that uh, in our politics today. Uh, so simply be someone who is trusted and respectable. Uh, and then we always have challenges. You know, our goal is to serve each and every citizen. I got my motto for this candidacy is people over politics. And the idea is to determine a challenge, figure out where we're at, where we want to go, how we're going to get there, and then how we measure it. So it's, it's a process. And then you work with colleagues. I've worked really hard over the last few years to develop a lot of relationships with both elected officials and other leaders uh, in government and around the community, and uh, and have civil conversations, talk through issues, find out what's going to make life better for Idahoans and move forward. Thank you. Now, we're going to move to our student question and answer, and we have uh, we're running up a little bit against the clock, um, so we'll try and be uh, as efficient as possible. And I want to start with a question for both of you about the Idaho legislature. And this is from a student at Boise State. 
Recently, the Idaho Legislature established a DEI committee. What are your thoughts on the establishment of this committee after the introduction of Senate Concurrent Resolution 134, which aims to limit state appropriated funds to student activities promoting DEI or social justice? Uh, Mr. Bridges, if you'd like to start. Uh, I'm not familiar with that exact bill, but I'll say in general. Um, I come from a generation, I, I believe in the foundation and fundamental values of our founding republic. We have life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And beyond that, uh, the thing that we should really focus on is opportunity. Um, what I personally see in uh, a lot of uh, DEI is taking one discrimination and replacing it with another. With, without a doubt, we live in a society where certain segments of our society have experienced discrimination, racism, etc. The only way that we're going to move forward is to recognize the value of every single one of us as an individual citizen, as an individual human being with incredible worth and dignity. And we have to have a society that's based upon merit and performance. So when we talk about jobs, when we talk about whether you're going to get into a school, it has to be based upon merit and performance and not other criteria. And, and that's the only way that we're going to continue to move up the mountain. So that's, uh, that's my position. Um, first of all, I, it was shocking to me to hear that diversity, equality, and inclusion became kind of a, a nasty idea because I think equality for all is important. Opportunity and inclusion for all is important. And I think diversity on our campuses is also important. Um, so those things, um, I do not support defunding those programs. Um, and I would also say that uh, in order for our state universities and our colleges to keep their accreditation, they have to have these programs in place. They're mandatory. And some of those programs are Title IX. It allowed women's sports um, to be uh, put into place where I grew up in a high school that didn't have a sport for women. We're cheering. We could do that truly. But um, so I see a tremendous advantage for um, our women to be able to participate in a sport in college. I don't think that's uh, a bad idea. And I, I want to make sure that all our students are supported. We have students that are coming, they're first generational college students. They don't have the background from home to, to push them to succeed. And we want them to succeed. We need them to succeed. And so having some programs in place that can pick them up or even the veterans program Veterans have different needs and uh, problems sometimes than a person just coming out of high school. They need that support. So I'm, I'm in favor of making sure all our children, all our students have opportunities. So. Thank you. I'm going to move on to another student question, which is about energy in Idaho. And this person asks, do you support the move toward clean and renewable energy in Idaho, specifically relating to nuclear energy and solar power? And we'll start with Mr. Bridges again. All right, uh, great question. And it's obviously, so I'll take my position, and it may kind of be uh, a little bit, I don't know if, um, if we look longer term, we clearly have a problem. It's worth putting it about five billion tons worth of CO2 in the atmosphere every year, 120 year half-life. We're seeing the results of fossil fuels. So we, we've got to make a change here. My personal opinion is that while um, solar and wind uh, are, are an option, it's not the ultimate option. And nuclear, we obviously have some um, legacy nuclear here in Idaho. But I would encourage everyone to go out to and Google a company called Helion Energy. Helion Energy is a company based in the state of Washington, and they're working on fusion power. What we don't hear in the news is that the science of fusion power is 
incredibly close to being solved. Helium, I think, said they could have production level electrical generators in place in the next three to five years. And there's another company down the East Coast as well. It just turns out if anybody's familiar with the Manhattan Project in Hanover, Washington, um, Hanover was one of the places that was uh, a key spot for the Manhattan Project. Because of that, there's a lot of nuclear know-how. And so nuclear is an option here in Idaho, but I would really encourage everyone to become knowledgeable of fusion. That's if there's one thing that we could do for your generation, it's to have an Apollo program that's focused on fusion. It's going to take some time and some energy, but that's going to put us in a place that where uh, nothing else, it, it can power us in a clean way beyond anything else. And thank you. And yes, um, I think everything's on the table to reduce our car carbon footprint. And INL, which is here in Idaho, is doing remarkable research. And these are very small, very small, tiny, I mean, they're, they look like a bookshelf, um, uh, old stereo is kind of, but they're, they're nuclear reactors, very little. Uh, nuclear waste, there are any problem with that, and they can power uh, whole buildings. And so we're seeing, they're on the cutting edge, and if you if you get a chance, you should go out and tour INL. It is amazing, the research they're doing there. And ISU is a part of that, and um, they do some work out of Idaho Falls also, but it's a remarkable program. Yes, solar should be a part, of our clean energy, wind when it's appropriate, maybe not downtown Boise, but where it's appropriate, yes. And hydropower is uh, a must here in Idaho. We have um, remarkable hydropower and it's clean and it's effective. So I think it's a it's gonna be a combination of energy uh, sources, but nuclear as they're coming into a whole new process of creating reactors, I think is going to be a piece of it. Thank you. We're going to have one final question from our students and then we'll move into closing statements for both of you. And that question is about some recent news in, uh, in Boise at least, which is our Boise State volleyball team. So they recently forfeited a game against um, San, was it San Diego um, and other universities have followed. San Jose, thank you. Uh, and the question is, um, what is the role of um, the cabal in Idaho, I guess, that adjusted how players can compete in sports? So what is the role of transgender students in sports in Idaho? We'll start with Senator Wardenko King. Thank you. You know, we haven't had a problem really in Idaho. Um, we've passed a lot of bills um, in the Idaho legislature, but those bills came from outside the state. We didn't have a problem in Idaho. I would tell you that I would adopt the same standards that the Olympic Committee did and that the NFL and the NBA have, and that is that um, you can't play a sport, if you're transgendering from a uh, woman to a male sport, or, or um, and I don't know if that applies to the other way, but I would adopt the same standards. I think they have done those for a reason. They've done the research. I have not, but, um, you know, I support the issues, um, ability to decide they don't want to play. I did understand from the article that that team has been beaten numerous times. So I think it was, it's possible to still compete if they wanted to, but if they don't, then I, su I support their decision. Thank you. Same question, Mr. Bridges. Uh, and I would agree with my opponent. Um, I think it's vitally important uh, that women's sports be uh, respected and protected as women's sports. Particularly something like volleyball, you can um, cause potentially serious injury and be a safety issue. And so I uh, absolutely agree with my opponent in, in both the house and the wise of protecting women's sports as well as women's sports. Thank you very much. With that, we're going to move into our final segment, which is closing statements. Uh, you each will have two minutes, like you did for your opening, to deliver a closing statement. And Senator Ward Engelking, we'll start with you. 
Well, thank you for um, allowing me to represent you. It's been a pleasure, for sure, to be in the legislature. Um, it's been an honor to uh, work with constituents. I go door to door two and three times a week, uh, all during the election cycle, along with some of my friends out here. They help me out a lot, but I get to hear what people are thinking, and I get to know what they care about. And I try to be respecting, respectful, and listen to everybody. Um, get the best information I can get before I make a decision on a bill, but it truly has been an honor. And, um, you know, I work really hard to be the type of legislator you can be proud of, um, and that means being honest and caring about people and working hard. I, grew, I learned um, what calluses and hard work were at a very young age on a farm. So I go to work every day uh, about six o'clock in the morning and I, when I'm in session and I get home about 10 and um, work for most of my lunch hours. So I try to get as much information as I can, but I have an open door policy. I would love to hear from all of you whenever you um, have an opinion. I'd like to see more hearings in committee where um, constituents are invited to testify. And I'd like to see more young people involved. And you all have an open invitation to meet with me at any time that uh, works for you. And also to go door to door with me. I'd love to have you because it would be great to have more students involved. And thank you for doing this uh, debate, for opening this uh, forum. It's great. And we should have more of them. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bridges. Yeah, I would like to start out by just saying uh, thank you once again, everyone, for hosting this, to BSU, uh, to everyone who uh, took the time out to be here tonight. This is just such an incredibly important part of our democratic process. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, the one thing I would, would like to say is we'd like to ask, um, answer a number of questions tonight, but as State Senators, our job is to take your concerns and represent you in the legislature. And so, uh, like my opponent, you know, my job is to represent you and do the best job for you in the legislature. So I would uh, welcome that opportunity. I would love to know your concerns and the issues that are important to you. And uh, students of uh, BSU, you know, I've spent decades in the private sector. I understand the private sector and I'm ready to go to work and bring business here and help grow jobs and wages and help you have a bright future here in Boise and in Idaho. So God bless you and God bless Idaho. Thank you. All righty. So that concludes our debate for today. On behalf of ASBSU, we want to thank you both for participating and all, you, and all of you guys for joining us. We hope that this debate has helped inform you and your perspective on the upcoming election. And please don't forget to go vote. Thank you.